We've just finished the, the feast of Pentecost. And uh, according, to the, according to the scriptures, now is when the, when the disciples go forth in order to complete or fulfill the Great Commission. Go forth to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go forth to different parts of the world. And it is, it's actually pretty interesting. After that, we would read about from Acts of the Apostles onwards, these apostles going forth to proclaim the good news. They got down to business. And it's, it's interesting if you, if you would actually look at, look at what these people were and what they were gifted with. You take all the, all the disciples, the apostles and the others as well, all of them, like I told during, during Pentecost, they were all misfits, you know, different places coming from different cultures, different backgrounds. They were not the same. They were, they were not like they were all people who liked each other. They didn't come together because they liked each other. They came together because Jesus called them, and he's called them with, from their different backgrounds. You have the fisher folk, you have uh, James, John, and and uh, James, John, and Peter, who were who were fishing. You had Matthew, who was a tax collector. You had people from different backgrounds. Maybe maybe the way they they dealt with things were different as well. And that is what we would see in the scriptures. They were so different from each other. It wasn't that they they just liked being with each other. And that is why we would see even in the scriptures that they. They did have their, their bit, of, uh, bit of battles. They had their, their problems with each other. And to add to that, after the anointing of the Holy Spirit, they are given the gifts and charisms of the Spirit. And all these gifts and charisms are different. They're not the same. Coming from the same Spirit, but different charisms given to different people. So you have a set of people who are so different from each other. They might be culturally different from each other. They shared the same faith, but they were culturally different. They were in different, different levels of society. And they had a variety of gifts. So there doesn't seem to be any commonality, just the fact that it all comes from the Holy Spirit. But still, you can see there you can see the differences cropping up time and again, even in the, in the Gospels, you see the differences cropping up time and again. You see James and John trying to get power and position. They ask for it. They even ask their, their mother to go and, and ask Jesus to, to give them the left and the right to have that power and position. You have people like, like um, Peter who... Who, who was so different from them as well. You have people like, like uh, Matthew who was so different. In between all that, them squabbling, we read about this in Luke chapter 22, verse 24. Luke 22, 24. The word tells us that they did squabble with each other. A dispute also arose among them as to which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest. There were disputes amongst themselves. It wasn't, it wasn't that they all just liked each other. But they had one aim. They had Jesus as their, their foundation. They had the spirit moving within them. But it's not that they liked each other. And that kind of is a, a typical reflection of what the church is today as well. The church is a set of Set of a lot of us who are so different from each other. Culturally, we are different. We, we come from different language backgrounds. We, uh, some of us, Mauritians, and you, you, you speak uh, the, very, the very classy French, which sounds very good in the confessional when they say the act of contrition, and uh, it comes out in French, and it's, it's beautiful to listen to that. We come from different, different backgrounds. The church is so culturally diverse. And it isn't that we all just like each other. I don't think we all just like each other. 
very often the people we don't like the most are the ones who are within our own church. We don't like each other. Maybe we don't, we don't fit well with each other. And that's, that's exactly what these apostles were. They didn't seem to fit well with each other. And then add to that different gifts and charisms. Not the same. Different gifts and charisms. And therefore, this, this makes a huge difference. It, it's, it's actually surprising. How did they actually pull it off? These people from different backgrounds, different cultures, how did they pull it off? Different gifts, different charisms, how did they pull it off? What made, what made their, their ministry work? What made them powerful? What made them grace-filled? What made them fruitful? Because the scripture tells us very clearly, Jesus says, you have not chosen me, I have chosen you so that you go and bear fruit. He chose them so that they will bear fruit. And they did bear fruit, coming from different backgrounds, coming from different cultures, coming from, from different thought patterns, having different variety of gifts, as the scripture would tell us in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that you could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 4, now there are a variety of gifts, but it all comes from the same Spirit. There are varieties of services for the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who activates all of them. There are varieties of gifts, varieties of activities. And there's a variety of people as well, all put together. And you think to yourself, how did this even work? How did they, as the early church, stick together in this ministry that God has called them to? How did they go forth? How did they evangelize? How did they reach out? How did they transform and change? Though they were so different from each other. For one, they knew that they had to use the talents and gifts God gave them. In Matthew chapter 25, verses, verses 14 onwards, we read, about the, we read about the parable of the talents, that the talents were given. And it was so significant that Jesus would say, the one who took the talent and hid it and gave it back at the end and said, this is, this is what, I, what you gave me. You're a hard task master. I've given you back what you have given me. And the Lord was upset with it. And that's something that we should always remember. We are all people who are gifted in different ways. We are spiritually gifted. We are also gifted in ways of talents. And we cannot keep it within our own selves to use for ourselves. There is a master who has given us our talents. There's a master who has given us our gifts. And woe to us if we do not use these. Woe to us if we use it only for our glory. Woe to us if we are selfish about it. Woe to us if we are egoistic about it. Because the gifts and talents that God gives us is meant to be used for his glory. And that is how they used their gifts. The first thing they did, they knew their gifts were meant for the glory of the church. On Pentecost, I spoke about the bride of Christ, that the church is the bride of Christ. And the Holy Spirit Filling, in filling the church is what makes the bride beautiful and presentable. And as the bride would have, the bride is adorned with the gifts and charisms. That is what you and I have. We have the gifts and we have the charisms, but it doesn't belong to us. The gifts and charisms belong to the bride of Christ. So none of the gifts we have, none of the charisms we have, belong to us. It is not for our personal use. It is meant to be used for the church. 
It is meant to be used for the glory of God. It is not meant for us. And we cannot use it like it was our private property. It is meant for the bride of Christ. In, in the scriptures, we see none of these apostles, as they were sent out to different lands and went to different places, they never used, they never used the charisms for themselves. They never used it for their glory. Every time they used it, they used it for the church. The gifts and the charisms of the Holy Spirit and everything we have is not meant to be used for ourselves. It has a purpose. It is sent out with a purpose. Just like, just like about the scripture, it says, the word has a purpose. It is sent out with a purpose. And it does not come back without fulfilling that purpose. In the same way, the gifts and charisms we have, have a purpose. It is, meant, it is sent out with a purpose. It is meant to be used for the bride of Christ. It is not yours and my personal property to use as we wish. It is meant for the glory of God. And that is why we would actually see in, in Acts chapter 8, about this person called Simon the Magician. Have you heard of Simon the Magician? I'm obviously not talking to the screen. I'm talking to the just a handful who are here because I'm finding it very, very difficult to actually concentrate on one set who is sitting at one side and the other who is here and I'm looking here in between and this is empty. Uh, or I might as well look at the screen. So I, I really don't know. At least voices can come forth. So have you heard of Simon the Magician? Okay, very good. So you know the Simon the Magician, where does he come in the scriptures? Okay, let's not parade our ignorance in public, in front of everyone. In Acts chapter 8, we read about Simon the Magician. So it, it starts out very, very interestingly. Si Acts chapter 8, verse 9. Now, he wasn't just a magician who was just doing a bit of magic and enthralled people. Rather, he was also proclaiming that's what the word says. Now a certain man named Simon had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he was someone great. All of them, from the least to the greatest, listened to him eagerly. Listened to him eagerly, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. They listened to him eagerly. So not only is he doing magic, he's also proclaiming. And they all listen to him eagerly and they're lapping it all up. But when they believed in Philip, who was working in Samaria, who was ministering in Samaria, who was proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, they were all baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. So Simon's not an unbeliever. Simon himself believed. After being baptized, so Simon's now baptized. He stayed constantly with Philip. So now he's around Philip all the time. He's baptized. Mind you, that means he's you and me. So he's baptized. He's constantly around Philip. He was amazed when he saw the signs and great miracles that took place. Now, when, when everyone's been baptized in Samaria, Peter and John come to Samaria to lay hands on all of them so that they might receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter and John start laying hands over each person and each one's falling and they are, they, are being, they are being filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit. And Simon sees this and Simon is excited. He's so excited that he, the scripture tells us in, in verse 18, that's Acts 8, 18. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. Now mind you, this is not just a pagan. This is not a person who doesn't believe, who's just walked in at the last minute and saw something enthralling and he thought, okay, I can pay for it and get it. The word says he stayed with them, he believed, he got baptized, he was around Philip, he's listened to Philip, after all this, he pays money and he tells Peter, this actually happens, this actually happens 
in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 9 is when Saul's conversion takes place. Simon's a very lucky man that he did this before Paul's conversion. If it was Paul rather than Peter who was dealing with this man, he would have been in a lot of trouble. Peter is a little more mellowed down. And that's why we see a mellowed down reaction actually. But uh, he, he pays money to, or he offers money to Peter and tells Peter, give me this power. Give me this power. For what? He wants to use it for his personal property. Give me this power. This looks exciting. Mind you, the signs and miracles, he never asked them for that. When the signs and miracles were happening, when Philip was, was touching and there were healings and miracles happening, he wasn't interested in that because he already was doing it with his magic. But when it came to the Holy Spirit and the laying on of hands through the Holy Spirit, at that time it enthralled him so much, he was ready to pay money. And that is when Peter responds to him and says in verse 20, but Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain God's gift with money. You have no part or share in this for your heart is not right before God. If you thought that this gift is meant for your personal use, your heart is not right before God. If we who are gifted with the gifts, charisms, and the gifts of the Spirit, when we think that we can use this according to our whims and fancies and according to how we want to use it, or when we want to use it, Peter tells us, your heart is not right with God. Woe to you if you think that you can use, woe to you if, you if you think that you can use your gifts the gifts and charisms of the Holy Spirit for, as your own personal property. It is the work of God. It, it, is, it belongs to the bride of Christ. When you have a gift, when you have a charism, it is not for your own. It is meant to be used in order to show the beauty of the bride of Christ. There's a purpose. There's a plan in it. It's not for our own use. And we are not supposed to keep it like that hidden talent. For one day you and I will stand in front of God and he'll ask an account of these talents, these gifts and charisms. And what are we going to say? I didn't use it because I found, I found it difficult to work with her. I found it difficult to work with him. I found the situation difficult, so I didn't use it. I kept it within myself. What account will we give? Or will, will the Spirit look at us abusing the gifts and charisms that we have within us, using it like it was our personal private property for our glory? Or is it used for the glory of God? The reason why these apostles were able to work it out was not once in the scripture do we see them using it for their own glory. They knew it meant, it was meant to be used for the glory of the church, for the glory of God, for the bride of Christ. Praise the Lord. And the second thing, they knew that though they were from different backgrounds, though they were so different from each other, though their gifts and charisms were different from each other, they knew that their gifts and charisms could be complete and their ministry could be complete only with the help of the other person's gifts and charisms. They were not loners. They didn't just go out and do their thing. They knew that their ministry needed the other's ministry. They knew that their charism needed the other person's charism. The completion is not, the completion can never happen without the other. We read in, in, we read in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, 
but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. I cannot use the gifts and charism for my own selfish ambitions. My gifts, my charisms work alongside my brother's gifts and my sister's charisms. It cannot work by itself. It works along with. And that is why, as, as in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 would tell us, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 speaks about how varied our, our gifts are. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. To each is given the manifestation of the, that's from verse 7 onwards, manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. To another, the utterance of knowledge. To another, faith. To another, gifts of healing. To another, working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discernment of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of the tongues. And, and you will see different dimensions of these gifts and charisms in all of us. With our baptism, we all are filled with gifts, charisms of the Holy Spirit. Obviously, we have to nurture it. We have to find it. We need to nurture and find it. But in all these dimensions of the gifts and charisms of the Holy Spirit, we are not given everything together. One person doesn't have everything. And there's a reason why. God definitely knows how we are. If one person has all the gifts and charisms, he or she will believe that they don't need the other. I remember when um, I was in Sydney and we used to have we used to have the retreat. We have the retreat center there, and during the retreats, there were times when it was difficult to get the musicians to come in because uh, some of them were working, some of them were in in uni, and there were times when it was tough. You know, you have to call one, you have to call the other. And there were times I used to get very irritated that I have to keep calling because maybe I came from this, this uh, uh, setup back in India where, where most of the musicians were waiting for a chance to get in. And uh, in Sydney, it was difficult. They had to come all the way uh, from the city. And so even when I came here to Melbourne to do my studies, I thought to myself, I'm going to learn the keyboard so that when there's a time where I'm, I'm going to you, you know, have to do an adoration and, and I don't have, the, I don't have the, the musicians around, I'll do it by myself. You know, I don't need them. I can do it by myself. And I actually gave it a try. I started going for classes and, and I, I realized that this is not something the Lord wants me to have. It took me, I, I went for around two or three months and I barely, barely studied anything with it. I still had to look and go pam, pam, pam and it never, never worked. Sometimes we start thinking to ourselves, I don't need them. I don't need them. I just want to work this out by myself. I don't need them. The gifts and charisms of the Holy Spirit are not given to one single individual all by ourselves precisely because we need to know that I need the other. I cannot minister all by myself. I need the other. All these days we've been having the the live streaming going on. There are people coming from, from nearly half an hour driving in and coming every day in the morning. Today morning it was nearly two degrees, three degrees, and it was, it was freezing, and, 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 and still they'd come. And the place where they are sitting is actually cold. There's no heater in there. I don't know if they put on that heater. That heater is still there. But, um, but I can't think to myself, I don't need them. I can do this by myself. It's just the Holy Eucharist. I, I know how to preach. I, I, I preach. There's the Holy Eucharist. I know how to celebrate a Mass. But I cannot do this by myself. I need the other. We all need the other. Ministry, when the apostles did their ministry, they all needed the other. And it's important for us to realize this, especially when we come together in our prayer groups, when we come together in our parish communities, when we come together in our little families, we cannot think to ourselves that I don't need the other. 
The other is essential to complete my gift. My gift does not work by itself. My charism does not work by itself. My charism needs the charism of the other. My gift needs the gift of the other to be complete. Let us not be arrogant thinking to ourselves, my charism is more than enough or my charism is better than the other. No one's charism is better than the other because the charism is not made of our own accord. The charism is gifted. The charism belongs to the Holy Spirit. It is not ours. And therefore, one cannot be better than the other. And therefore, even looking at someone else and having a charism that they have and thinking to ourselves that I want that charism because that seems to be better than mine. It is an insult to the Holy Spirit when we think that my gift is lesser than someone else's gift. It is an insult to the Holy Spirit when I think their gift is better than mine or my gift is better than theirs. Everything belongs to the Spirit to adorn the, the beauty of the bride of Christ. That is why we would read in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 25 to 26. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 25 and 26. That there may be no dissensions within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. One member suffers, everyone else suffers. One member is honored, everyone else will be honored. And therefore, there is no cause for us in our parish communities, in our prayer groups, in our church groups, even in our families, for me to look and say, the other is given more importance than me. The other seems to, seems to take all the glory than me. As the scripture tells us, if one suffers, all suffer. If one is honored, all are honored. That is how the spirit works with the charisms. It's all interconnected. I cannot be without the other. That is what they understood. The early Christian community understood that without the other, I cannot do. It's sad today to see so very often we bicker and we fight amongst ourselves as to who gets glory, who gets importance, who is up on a stage, who is not visible, who is not, who is not audible, who gets a chance, who does not get a chance. We are busy fighting amongst ourselves to see who seems to be more important than me. If one is honored, everyone is honored. If one suffers, everyone suffers. That is how the charisms work. In 1 Peter chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 10. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 10. Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, Serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. Serve one another with whatever gifts each of you has received. Serve one another. Every time I do my ministry, I am in service. It is not for me. It is not for my glory. It is for the bride of Christ. When I walk into the church, when I do, when I exercise my gifts, when I exercise my charisms, when I exercise my talents, am I keeping in mind that I'm, I'm projecting to the world the beauty of the bride of Christ, not me? When I get on to this altar and I celebrate the mass, it is not about me. It is about the bride of Christ. When I proclaim it is not about me, it is about the bride of Christ. If my proclamation is not good and effective, it has an impact on everyone on the church. My suffering is your suffering. If someone glorifies the way I preach, it is your glory. For the church 
We either suffer together or we are honored together, not as individuals. The church is not an individual. The church is not single ministries. And that is what makes us different from so many other denominations. We are not individuals. We are not individuals who find it difficult within this this community because he seems to have more importance than me and so I go and I start something else of my own accord. No, if he is important, I am important. If he is honored, I am honored. If she has fallen, I have fallen because we all belong to one church, one community. And therefore, never let ego control our gifts and charisms. Never let ego control our gifts and charisms. That is why these these apostles did so well. They didn't let their ego control their gifts and charisms. Take Peter. There's this beautiful experience that Peter went, not, not a beautiful experience for Peter, but an embarrassing experience for Peter, but beautifully done by Peter, responded by Peter in Galatians chapter 2. When Peter started making the mistake of going and not eating with the pagans. Having listened to some of the Jews, he wouldn't eat with the pagans. And in verse 11 onwards, Galatians 2, verse 11 onwards, but when Cephas came to Antioch, Paul is saying, I opposed him to his face because he stood self-condemned. For until certain people came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But after they came, he drew back and kept himself separate for fear of the circumcision faction. And the other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy so that even Barnabas was led astray by the hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not acting consistently with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before all of them, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel the Gentiles to live like the Jews? In front of Cephas, Peter, Paul didn't have a problem He spoke, he told, what does Cephas do? What does Peter do? He soaks it in. He didn't let his ego take control of his charisms. He didn't let his ego take control of his gifts. Rather, he permitted himself to get corrected. I think that's, that's so important and that's a problem we have within the church. We find it difficult to get corrected. The moment we are corrected within the church, it hurts. And immediately we pull back. I'm not going to be a part. I I didn't like what father said. And so I'm not going to be a part of this anymore. So I've taken my talent now and I've hidden it. And one fine day, the Lord will knock at my door. I'll open it and I'll give this one talent back to him and say, father was the problem. Who will give an account for it? Don't let your egos take control of your gifts and charisms. We read about people like Saul, a person who was nothing and who was gifted by God in in 1 Samuel chapter, chapter 13 onwards. We see how ego takes control of Saul. He was nothing raised up by God making him the first human king of Israel. He had everything gifted by God, but his ego wouldn't let him get corrected. When Samuel comes and corrects Saul, Saul is not ready to embrace that correction. He wouldn't let, his, he wouldn't, his ego wouldn't let himself be corrected. And therefore, his ego got the better of the gifts and charisms. Ultimately, we see Saul being more destructive than being constructive. Are we the same? With the gifts and charisms that we have, when we let our egos take control of it, we become more destructive than we are constructive. We break relationships. We break our parish communities. We break our our, our prayer groups. We break our ministries. When I let my ego take control of the gifts and charisms, I become more destructive than being more constructive. I don't bear fruits anymore. 
maybe success I will get. Success in terms of the world. And that is why we see if, if there's a correction within the church, I break away. I break away and I go and form maybe another church. Or sometimes like, like people say here in, uh, back in India, they can't do that because there, there's very clear jurisdictions. But here in Australia, it's free. You move from one place to the other. So I don't like the priest here in, in Holy Family. So let me now move to the other place. I don't like someone over here. Let me move to the other place. I don't like someone in this group. Let me start another group. Are our egos taking control of, of our spiritual gifts? Then we will become more destructive than we are constructive. Just like Saul did. And in, in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, Romans chapter 12, verse 3 says, <clears throat> For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Don't let your egos take control of your gifts, charisms, and talents. That belongs to someone else. Our gifts, our charisms, belong to someone else. If I'm able to preach, that is a charism, but it doesn't belong to me. If, if my superior or my bishop corrects me, and I find it difficult, and I say, I'm never going to preach again, it doesn't belong to me. For me to do what I want with it, I will end up being more destructive with it. I remember going to a family's house where they had this, this little modem that they had uh, got from a mobile company. But it was on a, it was on a what we would call a lock-in contract. So it, it didn't belong to, to, to them. It belongs to the mobile company. So there's this little child who's waiting all the time fidgeting with that. So every time he fidgets with it, his parents will keep saying, that's not ours, it belongs to the company. That's not ours, it belongs to the company. So every time he would fidget, their words were, that's not ours, it belongs to the company. Till the lock-in contract got over. The day the child came to know the lock-in contract got over, that day the child put, pulled it apart. Till that time, it's not ours. When I know it is not mine, I know I have to be careful with it. Are we aware that the gifts and charisms we have within us is not ours? It was given with a purpose, it belongs to someone else. It is that of the Holy Spirit. How do I use it? Do I think too highly about myself that this, this seems to be what I want to do with it? I, I, I can make it into something very destructive, destructive for myself, destructive for those who are around us as well. Don't let our egos take control of these beautiful gifts and charisms. We will not be fruitful. And the one thing that kept all these disciples using their gifts and charisms in amazing ways was because of the foundation of which is spoken of in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. When St. Paul says, what is the foundation in using all these gifts and charisms that we have? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 onwards. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. I could have any charism. I could have the charism of healing. I could have the charism of preaching. I could, I could have the charism of music. Irrespective of what I have, if I do not have love within me, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. Do I have love as the foundation of using 
all these gifts, charisms, and talents that I have. Unless we have that love within us, we will always struggle. Let's remember the early Christian community and how they spread. They spread because they knew the gifts and charisms were given for a purpose. It is not given for our own. Today, Jesus gives these gifts and charisms to all of us, irrespective of, of what background we come from, irrespective of what kind of ministry we are in, be it the charismatic renewal, be it the traditionalist, be it anyone. All of us have gifts and charisms. But is it founded on love? Is it founded on love? If it is not, at some point, our ego will get the better of us and we will forget that this comes from the Spirit and it belongs to the Bride of Christ and we will be far more destructive than we are fruitful. Let's close our eyes for a moment. Today even, as we open our hearts to the Spirit of God. O Spirit of Jesus, we thank you for having filled the church with gifts, charism, with so many various gifts, various dimensions of it that we get to see so often within our churches. O Spirit of God, they are not competition for us. When they are honored, the church is honored. I am honored. When they suffer, the church suffers. I suffer. Give me the grace to honor my brother, my sister, and the gifts and charisms that they have within them. Give me the grace to honor the gifts and charisms I have and to nurture them. For one day when, will we be, when we will be held accountable for it, we can proudly say that we have produced fruit 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.